Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Central Church of Christ. We're glad to have you here with us this morning. I have a few announcements I want to go through before we get into our time of worship. Uh, first of all, as I said, welcome, and we're glad to have you here with us. I want to tell you about next week. Men, you need to pay special attention. We're giving you one week warning. I know there's things that have been kind of crazy lately, uh, and so this is your chance to just kind of get ready and get prepared, because next week is Mother's Day, and that's a big deal. And of course, we're going to have the sermon and devotional and all that surrounding Mother's Day next week. And we want to tell you about something special that we're planning to do here at Central. You know, every year, we usually have some sort of special gift that we hand out, and the women can pick it up on their way out of the auditorium after worship. Since we can't meet together, uh, we are going to do something different. And so all females in the church, everybody that we have on our list, everybody that's a member, will be having something hand-delivered to you this week, sometime between Thursday and Saturday. We have a handful of people who are going to help us make those deliveries, but make sure you look forward to that. Uh, hopefully, it'll be a blessing to you as you look forward to this coming Mother's Day. Speaking of not being able to worship, I did want to just remind you and let you know, we made that announcement earlier this week. The decision was made based on all the information we've been given uh, that we are going to continue to worship only online through the month of May. We're waiting to hear how the governor kind of handles the next few weeks before we make any decisions about June and beyond. But as far as right now, we will not be worshiping live at the church building together until June, June at the earliest. Um, the sermon today is a standalone servant sermon. We wrapped up our series on grace last week. This week's sermon is, What is God Up To?, and really addressing things going on right now in our world, and I'm sure you can imagine what that might be. Uh, but we look forward to hearing what Ernie has to say about that. And that's all the announcements I have, so let's pray, and then we'll get into our time of worship now. Father, we are just so grateful to be gathered together today uh, virtually, and we're so grateful for this opportunity we have to worship you, God. Sunday is always such a special day to just focus our attention on you and and just unite uh, all in the name of Christ. And so, God, as we uh, get ready to worship now, we just pray that you'll help us as we, uh, as we seek to honor you with our hearts. It's sometimes a little more distracting when we're in living rooms and not all together in one room. Uh, God, I pray that you'll help us to clear our minds, uh, clear all distractions so that we can give you our undivided attention because you, you deserve nothing less than that. Uh, God, we love you so much. We really do. And we're so grateful for all that you do for us. Uh, and I'm grateful for the ways that you've been blessing us even through the season that we're in right now. Um, God, thank you for Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, the call to worship today is a new verse. It's from Habakkuk 3, verse 2. It says, Lord, I've heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. Repeat them in our day, in our time make them known. And we certainly have heard all about God's fame, haven't we? We know all about how he created the earth just with speaking into existence all that we see and all that we experience. We know all about how he met Abram and made a promise to him to make him, to give him descendants that outnumbered the stars, even though at the time he didn't even have a single child. We know all about how, how he uh, made a covenant with Moses and the Israelites, and he promised them this great promised land, even though at the time they were slaves to Egypt. He brought them out of that slavery. He led them into the promised land through mighty conquests that really they didn't have much to do with. God did it all for them. He just delivered it to them. We know all about David, King David, how God raised him up from a shepherd boy, and he promised him this kingdom that would last forever. And God fulfilled that through David's descendant, God's only son, Jesus. And we know that that kingdom exists even to this day, God's kingdom where he reigns, he is sovereign, he's in charge of all of it. And so we know and we trust and we believe that God can get us through anything because he's brought us so far up to this point. And so nothing that 2020 can bring us or throw at us is too big for the God that we worship. Let's worship him now. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you, open my eyes, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, Lord, please open my open eyes, open the eyes of my heart, cause I want to see you, I want to see you. 
Thank you for joining in today, worshiping together today. Those are great arrangements, not exactly as we sing them, but mostly, and we're blessed to have those uh, recordings and also to be able to legally string them. So when you see those words at the bottom of the screen, that's because we've paid the rights to do that, and that means the people who produce those pieces of art are being rightly compensated. The church, above all, should be law abiders where we can, and uh, so that's why we do that. We also uh, want to make sure if you have a prayer request, it can be sent in. And that email address on the screen, prayer at spartanburgchurch.org, is the place to send the prayers. Now today, the sermon will lead into our communion time, and I hope you see why when we, uh, Lord willing, get to that place. Well, no doubt over time, our prayer request list could be longer than what we've been working off of. Those are categories and suggested prayers. I particularly like the last two. Anything or anyone else that's on your heart and mind, we collectively are praying. And knowing, as we talked about last week, that uh, when we can't articulate, or we don't even know exactly what God would want us to pray for, the Holy Spirit sends our deepest emotional sizes, prayers, and, and worshipful prayers to the Lord. And th that in all the things that we do, God would be glorified. That's the ultimate goal of a Christian, that God would be high and lifted up in all those things. Now, we know what prayers sound like, but sometimes in the Bible, and our reading today, which leads to our lesson, is a prayer that doesn't sound like the prayers that almost we ever would hear in a, in a worship service or in a small group, but maybe when you're alone in your closet in that special hiding place, that war room, you might pray like Habakkuk did in chapter 1. How long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen, or cry out to you violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law of God is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked him in the righteous so that justice is perverted. That's his prayer. Well, God responds. God says to Habakkuk, this is God's answer. Look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed. For I'm going to do something in your days that you would not believe 
even if you were told. And then Habakkuk responds, Oh Lord, are you not from everlasting? But then he says, My God, my Holy One, we will not die. So uh, I don't know if we're going to pray like that out loud. Maybe in your heart, that's where your heart is in frustration. Lord, we pray that we would trust in you with all our heart and not lean on our own understanding, that in all our ways we would acknowledge, we would confess that you are holy and high and lifted up and you know everything and you're all caring and you, you show us mercy and, and grace and loving kindness and that therefore you would make our path straight. You would carve out the path for us to walk in our lives and our prayers and our relationship and in this crisis that we're in. We pray for all the prayers that have been offered. And above all, that we would see Jesus always high and lifted up, giving himself for us on the cross, high and lifted up, exalted as the risen Lord and Savior, and that all we would do to be to your glory through him in whose name we pray. Amen. So what is God up to? Uh, who speaks for God? I don't know any more than you do specifically, but let's see if we can find something in the Bible to help us as we deal with our current situation and with all trials that come our way. First, some form of this question is asked a lot. It is not a new question. Moses asked, why, Lord, why have you brought trouble on this people? King David asked, why, Lord, do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? And not just individuals, the whole nation of Israel cries out, Lord, God of Israel, why has this happened to Israel? So when we ask a question like this, it's not a new question, and it's not a bad question. Not asking God is wrong. There's a concept in the Old Testament called inquiring of the Lord. The New Testament says, knock, ask, seek. And when you don't, well, that's what we pointed out by God is something we shouldn't be doing. The people did not turn to God. They did not inquire. That's why they made mistakes. That's why they went away from the Lord's path. So it's not a new question. It's not a bad question. And here's the deal. God promises to answer. The psalmist says, it was the day I called for help. Lord, you answered me. And in one psalm, Psalm 91, we get God answering himself. These are God's words in answer to a prayer. God says, when he calls me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him with long life. I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Notice that last line, two promises. God promises in all these things, I'll give you satisfaction and I'll give you that by showing you what I am up to. And right there I'm telling you what God is always up to. Let's see if we can see it because God promises to answer or not asking is a bad idea. This is not a new question, but folks, that doesn't mean we're going to get it right, that we're going to know what God is up to. Uh, John Piper says God is always doing 10,000 things in your life and you may be aware of three of them. And I kind of like that Dr. Piper said, you may be. <laughs> you may get two right or one right or really none right. He's infinite. We are not. And then there's the, the quote that I referenced in the Devo promo that Michael sent out earlier in the week. Uh, Eric Raymond, uh, who writes for Crossway, says about this situation right now. I wrote it just a couple weeks ago. If we had a $10 donation for every time someone postulated as to what God was doing in this situation, every church We'll be making church budget. By the way, we are. Thank you very much. Thank you for your generosity. But you see his point. And then he says, there are mysteries here, right here, right now, that we simply do not know. So, reviewing. Asking what or why of God is not a bad thing to do. Not inquiring of God is unwise. And God promises to answer our serious, humble, God-honoring inquiries, even though we may not figure it out. And not only that, we, not, not only will we not figure out what he's doing, we may not like it if we did. And those last two we get from what we're studying today from uh, Habakkuk, from the first chapter of Habakkuk. Now let me tell you what we know about Habakkuk. Almost nothing. Almost nothing. There's nothing autobiographical or biographical, in the book of Habakkuk, there's a line or two in Daniel 
We think it's the same guy, but we don't even know how to say his name. So if you want to say Habakkuk or Habakkuk or Habakkuk or whatever, we don't know. So I'm going to say Habakkuk because that's how I heard it first. We do know from his book and other references, he lived around 620 years before Jesus was born. And he lived in some great times because good King Josiah took the throne. Question, how old was good King Josiah when he became king? What's the answer? He was eight. And if that doesn't scare you to death, I don't know what will. But he turned out to be great. He reestablished the word of God being read and studied and obeyed. And he reestablished the worship of God by the people of God. And we're so, why should we be surprised that peace and prosperity for four decades followed in the rule of this wonderful man that God appointed? But like happens so many times in scriptures, it seems like the sons don't live up. And he had some sons, and, and they've got names Jehoiachim, Jehoiakim, and, and there's one other I can't pronounce. They were really irresponsible and brought on just kind of the opposite, some really, really bad times. Well, Habakkuk's right at the end of the good days, and he can see the bad days coming. And it's, the whole thing is just a conversation, three chapters, between Habakkuk and God. We're going to just look at chapter 1 and look at sort of under four topics, what Habakkuk saw, what he did, what he heard, and then from that carefully, humbly, Hopefully, correctly, what does that, what did it mean to him? What does it mean to Christians? What does it mean to you and me today? So what did Habakkuk see? Look at those words that jump out at you. He saw violence, injustice, wrong, destruction, violence against, strife, conflict, law being paralyzed, justice never prevailing, wicked hemming in the righteous, and justice being perverted. That's what he saw. And that's what, he, that's, what he, that's what he prayed. Let's look at a couple of those. Look at that image. It's like there are people still obeying you, God, but all around us are wicked people. So outside the country and inside the country, wicked, trapping, imprisoning, maybe like we're animals and they're putting us in the corral, the righteous. And then he's not pointing out the finger only at bad people. He's pointing a finger at God. He says, why do you, God, make me look at all this bad stuff? And then why do you tolerate wrong and then on top of that I'm calling out to you apparently maybe he's done it before or whatever but he says you haven't answered me on this what's going on in his day is what I think is described really succinctly in Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 12 wisdom literature wonderful imagery as fish are caught in a cruel net let's say vivid imagery it's kind of gruesome as birds are taken in a snare so people are trapped by evil times that fall, and look at that word, unexpectedly upon them. Times that weren't what they thought they would be, and man, it come out of nowhere. Does that ring with anybody? <laughs> That's what's going on in this man's life. What he saw, and you can fill in the blanks, I'm calling them dark days. Dark days coming, dark days ahead, even dark days there. And what I mean by that? Well, clearly, in life, there are, there are really, really good times. It was Emil Ku, who's sort of the great-grandfather of the self-help movement that even goes on today, who is credited with coining the phrase, and I'm tempted to do it with the French accent, every day and every way I'm getting better and better. It sounds more like Clouseau than it does a real French guy. But, but, you know, it's just things are getting better and better and better. These are the good old days. And what does it mean? It means like my parents had it better than their parents. And Peggy and I had it better than our parents. My mom's still with us, but you know what I mean, uh, that, that we had more opportunities and things just went really well. And I'm just confident Zach, my, our son, is going to have it better, better than me. Why? Because these are the good old days. Those are really, really good times and such was the case. For the four decades of King Josiah, better and better, health, prosperity, peace, it was as good as it can get because they're good days and good times, but there are dark times. Well, in the U.S., if you just look back, depending on where you were in the country, uh, from about 1870 to the very beginning of the 20th century, you know, the Civil War was over, Reconstruction had done what it was doing, but, but jobs were growing everywhere. We were filling out the country, and, and there was all kinds of work for all kinds of people, and, and it really were things were getting better and better and better and better. Same length of time Josiah reigned, about 40 years of good days in America. 
what about the next 40 years from 1911 to 1950? Well, in case you don't know, or it may be reminded, World War I, the Great Depression, World War II, and right part of that was the Holocaust, where 6 million plus people were killed because of their ethnicity, murdered, slaughtered. Oh, and one thing I left out, the 1918 pandemic in the United States and in the world, 50 million people died in the world, 675 thousand in the U.S. You can see where I got those totals. Just in case you're wondering, based on percentage of population, if the same percentage, God forbid, were to die in the United States today with what we're going through, 23 million deaths if it was the same rate. Let's just pray nothing, nothing like that. But, but the song Happy Days Are Here Again, not the TV show, but Happy Days Are Here, was written the year the Depression started, 1929. FDR brought it out as a campaign song, but it was more of a wish and maybe a promise than a reality because, well, in 1950, after World War II, in Europe, in, in, in you know, France, people were starving to death. Dark, dark days and in Habakkuk's time, it's about to go into some really, really dark days. So here's a blending point. The idea that there will only be good days, that good days where things are getting better and better and better, that that's the norm, and that's what we all should have and deserve, okay? And that's what I want. Where everything gets better and better and better, that's a mistaken idea. History shows us, the Bible shows us there are good days and there are dark days. And Habakkuk had been through good days, saw dark days, and what really bothered him was he saw God not doing anything as best he could tell about it. That's what he saw. Number two, what did he do? <laughs> he talked to God and the tone, I don't know. You think you find this respectful? How long must I call for help? You're not listening, God. And so here we are today, it's different. Um, that guy looks like he's got a pretty good view on a big city. I kind of think that's San Francisco, but I'm not sure. But look at what we're going through, right? And we're going, how long? And that's the question from the beginning. How long is this going on? So I don't think I've had it all that bad. I've been very, very blessed. I've been healthy. And everybody in the church seems to be uh, that way. But different ones have had different things we've had to give up. So I want you just to help us think through this. Think of what, something, the, maybe the biggest thing you didn't get to do or you had to give up because of all the restrictions uh, placed on us during this season. I think for Peggy and me, pretty clearly, and also for another couple in this church, we had to give up. We had planned to go on a mission trip to El Salvador. It was a medical mission slash uh, Christian mission sponsored by the, the medical school VCOM. Uh, we were going to go to El Salvador the first week in April. So it's already come and gone. And needless to say, uh, that trip was canceled long before any restrictions came this way. But we were going to do this, and I was gonna, looking forward to it. I'd never been on an international mission trip, done some domestic stuff in the United States, but I'd never, ever done on that. I mean, you know, it was, I mean, we were really fully invested in it. I mean, I'd already, you know, had to take all those uh, vaccines. I wasn't crazy about that, but, you know, I'm all in, so I took all the vaccines. And not only that, we, I wanted to, you know, El Salvador, I wanted to find out about it. I learned about the culture. We were going to be there right at a time at a really big holiday. And they always had there that we actually some month long, but the week we were going to be there, there's these big festivals and they wear costumes and they, they get dance. They dance, have a special national dance for that holiday. So Peggy and I, we bought the costumes. We took the lessons. Here's a picture of Peggy and Ernie the last day that we were, we had take the, taken the lessons. And you see, we really were all into it. And we have a similar picture of the other, other couple that were, were going on the trip. And I'm not going to show it, and, but somebody owes me really big right now for not showing that, okay? By the way, that is the traditional costume of the country called El Salvador. And we didn't get to go. Now, one of the main reasons is that young lady right there. Do you all remember Maria? Uh, Maria has been a member of Central for a couple of years. She's from El Salvador. She goes to VCOM. She's here learning, trying to, to pass the test, become a board-certified uh, doctor and a physician. And she was back in her country. She needs to come back and take some tests. Let me tell you something else was in the plants. She wanted to be, and we had already you know, commissioned this, a volunteer uh, missionary slash evangelist 
for Christ and the central congregation at VCOM. Because there's a lot of people there that were saying they were Christians but weren't going to church. And she was going to try to when she came back, and she's supposed to have been here right now, recruiting people to come to Central and leading them to faith. So there were great plans. You know, she had these marvelous plans. Well, she's back home, and that country is, set, is shut down. She was excited about being there. We were going to get to be with her and her church and try to encourage, I don't know what I could do to help their church, but just to meet some other Christians. And it was just so going to be so exciting. And she was really excited. And we, we know what happened. So she sent a letter just this week. I want to read a little bit of it. She said, in El Salvador, we are in quarantine up until May 16th. The businesses are to open gradually, but still a lot of restrictions. We're waiting for official decisions from our government. Maybe back to normal June slash July. Then she says about her church. We are working online. We have worship and Bible study online. It's worked pretty well. We are waiting for the best. But then she said there are people getting desperate because in our country, gang activity has increased with all the shutdowns and the restrictions that have gone on with the quarantine. So she has a prayer request, and I'm sharing it. I would like to ask Central if you can pray for El Salvador the economic situation, so that people won't always be without work and that will not be without food. So I'm joining, and you are too, to pray, pray for it. So it, it just didn't happen, and it's like, that was going to be a really good thing. Why didn't, we, why didn't we get to do it? And so I didn't pray like this, but Habakkuk does because he sees dark days, and it looks like he's being you know, slightly irreverent, but then there's this line, Oh, Lord, this is verse 12. Are you not from everlasting? And we don't get that in the English. But what I read said that's about as insulting a thing as anyone says to God in the whole Bible. It's a rhetorical question. Are, are you not from everlasting? It's like he's saying, I, I, thought, I, thought you were, I thought you were holy, but look at all the wickedness. I thought you were kind, but look at all the suffering. In other words, are, are you not eternal? It's basically saying, look, I, I thought you were supposed to be God, and you're not coming through. And the, that language in that sentence right there, it's almost always used, never, never anybody to God, this is the only time, is when people are mad. This is exactly the, some of the verbs, and, and we would call them nouns, it's exactly what what Esau said about Jacob when he found out Jacob had stolen the birthright. And this guy's saying it to God. I thought you were, I thought you were God. Are you not from everlasting? But notice, that's 12a, 12b. My God, you are my holy one. We will not die. So clearly he's mad. What is he doing? What's he not doing, all right? Well, he's not... Keeping it in sight. You know, some, don't ever show your emotions if you're Christian. No, not this guy. He's not denying his feelings. No, he's not sinning. You know, we do. We, get, we sin. We gossip, and that's a sin. We go to various media, and we post in arrogance or anger. He's not doing whatever would be, you know, the 600 years before Christ, the uh, uh, equivalent of that. But look what he is doing. He's expressing his anger, his doubt, his fear, his frustration, and he's expressing it to who he calls my holy one. What do we call that? Prayer. He is doing that in prayer. He is praying. And look at the difference. I thought you were eternal. But you are. You're my, you're my holy one. And we're not going to die. Now let me tell you what he's doing. He's doing something that when I was a kid, me and my brother, my brother and I, uh, we really got into... And uh, so, like the guys in the little white and red outfits, that's uh, Rip Hawk and Sweet Hanson. And the guy with a headdress, that's Chief Wahoo McDaniel. By the way, he was, I don't think he was Native American, but that was his deal. Does anybody know what we call that uh, sport? Well, some people call it wrestling, but that ain't what we call it. Help me out here. They call it what? Wrestling. That's what that was. And here's the deal. Don't tell my mom. I know, she's, I know you're watching, Mom. Uh, on Saturdays, it was on TV, but we weren't supposed to watch. And that, the reason wasn't they didn't think it was evil. I'll tell you the reason in a minute. But Dad, on Saturday, was always working on his sermons for Sunday. And Mom was always cooking because we always had people over after church, you know, to have them in our home and fellowship and that kind of stuff. So my brother and I would sneak, and we would watch wrestling on TV. And here's why they didn't want to watch it. When those guys started wrestling, my brother and I would start wrestling. 
And I loved wrestling because I was the older brother and I was bigger. And guess who was the undefeated, undisputed wrestling champion of the Thick Pen household? You were looking at it. Applause are appreciated. Look at this thing down here on the bottom. That was always the big moment in the wrestling match. You'd jump off the top belt of the ring. And we were not to be outdone. Did we have a top belt? No. But you know what we did have? We had bunk beds. And I would come off the bunk bed, and he was just like, what could he do? There was only two things my brother could do, nothing and like it, right? That's the Ric Flair line. And so I'd just take him, I'd body slam him, and it was great. And we did that for years. I remember the very last, it's kind of nostalgic, very last time my brother and I wrestled. And you know when it was? It was the day I didn't win. And he didn't win. It was a tie. You know what happened? Over time, his strength had caught up with my strength, and suddenly, I know this wrestling thing, that's for babies. I don't need to do that anymore. Let me show you another wrestling. That's a dad and a son, and they're tied. Why? Because the dad is allowing it. The dad is allowing it. Here's what Habakkuk did. He faithfully wrestled with God. You see that? Because God let him do that. Now, let me show you what I mean by that. There are people who, in tough times, forever, will look at this and look at tough times and say, I can't understand why God would let something like that happen. So, I'm not going to believe in God anymore. I won't believe in a God who does something that doesn't make sense to me. You've heard people say something like that. So let's go from the wrestling match to moms and a couple of kids at the grocery store. And you know how your kids are when they're five and independent. They want everything. And your little daughter, precious, wonderful baby doll that she is, sweetie that she is, she wants sweets. She wants cupcakes, and she wants candy, and she wants juice, and she wants lollipops, and you're just saying you can't have that, and you can't have that. You can't have that, and she's going to go, that doesn't make any sense. Why can't I have that? Now, what could you do? Well, you could say, honey, let me explain nutrition to you and so forth. See, what's going on is mom understands at a, an adult level, and as wonderful as your daughter or your son happens to be, at best, she understands at a really advanced child level. And the difference between her level of understanding and the mom's level of understanding is immense. So ultimately, if the mom's not frustrated with the kid, which she says, just get in the cart and don't say anything else, you know, or whatever, what she really will say is, honey, you, you got to trust me. you got to trust me. And here's the wonderful thing about kids. That's why Jesus said, you got to accept the kingdom like a kid. The, kid, the parents will be trusted by the children. They can always come back. How high is God's mind above our mind? The distance is infinitely greater than between a parent and a child. And when tough times come, what is God always saying to us? Trust me on this. Tim Keller says, to say God has to make sense makes no sense. Let me just ask you, do you want a God that doesn't know any more than you know? That's a scary thought. I want a God who knows everything and not just what, what I know. And so he's frustrated. He cries out, I thought you were God. And he wrestles with it because he also knows you are God. He said, I don't understand, Lord. I'm frustrated. I'm upset, Lord. I'm pouring that out to you. But, but I'm not going anywhere I, I, you are the Holy One. To whom shall I go? Like the apostle said, you had the very words of, of life. That's, that's what Habakkuk did. He, he wrestled and, and he waited. He wasn't going to go anywhere. And then he, then he heard per, from God. <laughs> God's not like us. Here's what the answer God gave. Look at the nations, the world, and watch and be utterly amazed. I don't take your breath when God said, Hold on and watch. I'm going to do something, Habakkuk, in your days about what you're talking about. And notice this line, that you would not believe even if you were told. You ever said that? You wouldn't believe me if I told you? Did you know that God coined that phrase? God's the first one to say that. So Habakkuk is going, 
Explain what you're doing, Lord. And the Lord says, if I told you, Habakkuk, you wouldn't get it. And Habakkuk says, tell me anyway. Tell me what you're going to do about all the violence, Lord. And the Lord says, if I tell you, you won't get it. And he says, tell me anyway. I want to know. Okay, Habakkuk, I'm going to send even more violence and injustice. And Habakkuk says, I don't get it. <laughs> Which is what God told him and what maybe God will tell us. See, God's answer to Habakkuk's complaint about violence and injustice does not compute. Here it is. I'm going to send the Babylonians to take you guys into captivity from Judah, and they are the most violent and the most unjust, wicked, evil crowd that you have ever, ever seen. And that's when he says, I thought you were God. <laughs> you call that an answer. Write it down. God's ways are not our ways, now I could draw it out, but let me tell you, we got this from, da- from the book of Daniel. Daniel had a vision. He laid out, God's angel laid out the future, and it's right what God is doing. There were, there were the Babylonians and the Persians, and they take Judah, Israel into captivity. After, what, 70 years, a good many of them come back to Judah and Jerusalem and rebuild it, but a lot of the Jews did not. They are dispersed. And as they go, they talk about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And not only do they influence themselves and set up synagogues wherever they go, people who are pagans, who are Gentiles, start believing. And so we have these god fears everywhere all over the world. And then along comes Greece. And Greece overthrew uh, Babylon and Persia, and they gave us education, and they gave us law. But you know what they really gave us? They gave us a common language. They gave the world that. So that no matter where you were from, you probably knew Greek and you communicate. And listen, if you wrote a book, you'd write it in Greek so everybody could read a book like the Scriptures. And then Rome came along and they, they did a lot of things, including build all the roads and create the Pax Romana peace everywhere. So there was free travel, a common language. And the Bible will say, when the fullness of time had come, God sent Jesus. I like the easy reader version at just the right time. God sent his son who was born for a woman. He sent Jesus to live, to die, to rise, to start the church, to commission the word when there was a common language, when there was easy travel and peace. You say, yeah, but what about the dispersion? Wherever the gospel was preached, the first responders were the God-fearers. And there were God-fearers everywhere because the Jews had been dispersed. God was working in the long view at everything. And so within 180 years from one guy with 12 followers, the known world had heard the message and many people had come to faith. And it was the dominant faith numerous places because God worked in bad things to bring about the ultimate Good thing. You say, that's an interesting theory, but what makes you think that? The Bible tells me so. One of those missionaries taking, as you know, the main one to the Gentiles is Paul. He's up in what we now call Turkey. He's preaching to Jews. He's preaching to God-fearing pagans. He's preaching just to pagans. You know, the God-fearers are there. And so he's preaching Jesus who lived, who died, who was raised on the third day. And you've got to believe in him. You've got to come to him. You've got, you've got to give your life. You've got to obey the plan of salvation. And then he says this. He says to them, look and be utterly amazed. He's quoting God. Do these words sound familiar? He said, Paul says, take care. What the prophets have said does not happen to you. Look and be utterly amazed For I'm going to do something in your days that you would not believe, even if you were told. He takes what God told to Habakkuk, and he said God was talking about Jesus and faith and salvation in the church and the kingdom of heaven. It's so easy to see the long view, both looking back and in other people's lives. Think about Joseph. He was a spoiled brat. Without all the bad that happened, what kind of guy do you think he's going to turn out to be? But you know the story, and he ends up, you know, there's 20 years of suffering and not one clue that he hears from God, even though the Bible keeps saying, but the Lord was with him. We may not understand God working, but God is with his people. And ultimately, we know he has that big reunion. He's at the top of the the government in Egypt. He's saving people in a famine, including his family. 
And he looks at them, and he has a moment of insight. And he says to the brothers who are worried, you know, we, we, we saw this guy into slavery. What's he going to do now daddy's dead? You intended it for harm. You intended to harm me. But God was working in your bad. What you did was bad, but God intended it for good. And it's not just good for you and me that we're back together, but to accomplish what's being done, the saving of many, many lives. And, and Joseph will say earlier in the story, don't interpretations belong to God. So, you know, that's what he heard. He, he's, God said, be amazed. And what we figure is God's, you know, he's working in, for years and decades, you know, throughout the timeline of, of all humanity into eternity. So don't judge me on my own term table, uh, timetable. Judge me, don't, not on yours, but on, but on mine. So that's what he saw, evil times, what he did. He, he wrestled faithfully and he waited and he heard God say, <laughs> You're going to be amazed. You're not going to understand it. <laughs> but I'm really doing something unbelievably wonderful. All right, now what does that mean to you and me? Okay, and what does it mean uh, there? So let's look again at that last little thing where God says, don't make the mistake of judging me by your own timetable, your own measurements, your own calendars. I'm going to use the illustration of my trip to El Salvador, and, and I'm going to use it in a way that I don't, do not mean, okay? I, I'm going to use it. I don't mean this, but I want to tell you, I kind of kidded about this. Let me see if I can, it'll make more sense when, when I talk. And the thing is, we have such a strong, I don't know, built-in tendency to view everything focused on me. I'm the important one. Me and mine, uh, we're the important one. So, early on when we were getting ready to go to El Salvador, what was the one thing in prep you know that I didn't want to do? Yes, get all those shots. The little vaccines, they don't hurt. But when you get vaccines, you know, they make you feel icky for a day or two. And I was supposed to get, I don't know, three or four of them. I didn't want to do that. So I kind of kidded because I knew I heard about this virus thing coming from wherever over in the Far East thinking, well, you know, maybe this trip will be canceled. God will make the trip. God will, God will use the, the virus to make the trip cancel. I won't have to have the, the vaccines. Yuck, yuck, yuck. Isn't that funny? Now, look, I didn't really mean it, but I did kind of kid that way. Let me get a little more serious about that. Uh, and that would be that, well, one, a phrase we've learned during this time is underlying conditions. Got that one? Heard that one? I got two of them. One of them is the age thing. I am right on the number. <laughs> Puts me in the vulnerable group. And listen, I am extremely blessed and extremely, uh, you, you know, fortunate. Uh, but I uh, have leukemia. It is, you'd have to do almost a genetic level test. Now the medicine has worked so well to find it, but it's still there. And so there were really people in my family and my friends who, when they heard I was going to El Salvador, said, with your condition, this is long before they heard about any virus thing. Do you really want to go out of the country? And my line was, hey, I'm going with the medical mission team. There's 35 of us, 29 of our doctors. I'll, I've never been safer, right? But they said, look, we're going to pray for God's will. And so then long before there was anything like any thought of restrictions here, uh, VCOM called off the, the trip due to the virus. And I kind of kidded, hey, I can tell you who can get prayers answered. There were some people who didn't think it was best for me to go to El Salvador. They prayed and God sent a plague or, a, you know, a, an epidemic. That, okay. I mean, I really said that. I, I know better, but let's be sober about this whole deal. And here's some sobering numbers. Okay. And, you know, who knows how specifically accurate, but according to South Carolina DHEC, that's the number of people that have died from the coronavirus in Spartanburg County, the state of South Carolina, the United States of America, and the world. Do you understand if I said, this is why God sent the virus so that I wouldn't have to go to El Salvador? Do you hear the self-centeredness of that? I mean, if that were true, I certainly couldn't do it to everybody, but I need to have one of those teleconference, those Zoom things with, I don't know, some people in South Carolina and say, listen, friends, I'm sorry that your relatives are dead, your grandparents or your parents or your, your maid or your siblings or, God forbid, even one of your children. But you got to understand, you know, God didn't want me to go to El Salvador, so he sent that, and, you know, your family's dead. But you got to understand, I'm just so much more important to God than, can you, I mean, I'm just embarrassed I'll get out having to say that. I'm just trying to think, I, and I, I'm thinking up here, but when you think deeply and biblically, we can't think like that. The Bible says that with humility to count others, and that's the 235,065, 
more significant than you do yourselves. All of them, plus everybody else in the world. That it's not about me. And it's never been about me. So this formula is wrong. X, Y, or Z, actions or attitudes or activities, was or wasn't happening and God didn't like it. So, thus, therefore, hence God sent the virus. That's what I'm saying. You know, uh, I was going to go on a trip I shouldn't go on, so God sent the virus. You see? No, no, no. But we're not evil for thinking like that. It's always good to try to figure out what God is doing. And as Jesus told the young man in Mark chapter, I think it's 12, you're not far from the kingdom of God. We're not far from Bible thinking. This is biblical thinking, and I can show you from the Bible. God allowed that or brought the the virus because God's in control of all things. There are some things that maybe we noticed in our own lives that were happening to need to stop, weren't happening to need to increase. So thus, therefore, hence, we learned some lessons and we made the changes. We learned it. See, God wants us to... To learn from that, I know that because, I mean, the Bible tells us how God wants us to benefit from trials. To, if our faith becomes pure through this, that's what God wants. If our, our endurance increases through this of faith, that's what God wants. And he wants us to be more mature, more concerned with others and what I want and what I'm not getting to do. And this is all about me. No, God wants to mature us in this thing because that's what God wants us to do with all our tests and all our trials and all our troubles. And that would be triumphing if we are more mature, if we are stronger and can endure more and we have a a more pure faith and trust in God. God's up to that. It really comes down to what, how we see life, the lens through which we see life. Now, I'm going to talk about some glasses, and I'm going to label them, and they're all good things. I'm not saying that one way is great and everything else is from the pit or devil. They're all good. Let me work with you here. Okay, so through what lens do we see life? Sometimes people... See life through money and finances and the economy. There is a place for that in Scripture. The Bible has lots to say about money. Here's the thing. That is never in the Bible to be the primary lens through which we see life. Are you tracking with me? Important but not primary. How about our nation? I love America. I am hyper-patriotic. All right. And so we see things through what's best for America. And in America, there are politics. And there's, Jesus said, render to Caesar. There's a place for politics. There's a price for patriotism. But they're never to be the chief lens through which I interpret the world. And then here's the big one. What's best for me and mine? Frankly, if it's something on the other side of the world, it doesn't bother my family, it doesn't bother me, no big deal to me. I understand that. The Bible says if I don't take care of my family, I'm worse than somebody who doesn't even believe in God. Okay, but even that can't be the primary lens lens through which we see life. What is? We can have all of those lens as long as the contact lens is Jesus as revealed in Scripture. God is His own interpreter. He makes things plain through Jesus, this is all about Jesus, including we evaluate the trials of life, this one or whatever, through Jesus. That's exactly what Habakkuk was doing. I thought you were eternal, but wait, 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 wait. But, but, but your God, he doesn't know it because he doesn't know what God is doing through this, but he's looking through the Jesus lens. And that's what we are to do, too. And that's what Maria is doing, too. Let me read the rest of her letter. She last said, uh, I'm worried about what the future holds for my country because people are without food. But, she says, I have faith that everything's going to be okay because God's plans are perfect. That's what God told Habakkuk. And that's what she has understood. And she finishes, I'm as central. You're always in my prayers. And I really pray I can come back as soon as the current situation is over. So, so, so what does it mean? It means in all these things, we trust God and we see life through Jesus, particularly the death and the resurrection of Jesus. What Jesus did for us and how God shows that all the promises are true. You say, I didn't see anything about Jesus in Habakkuk. 
Chapter 1, verse 2, the first thing we read, How long, O Jehovah, must I cry for help and you do not hear? You ever heard anybody else cry out? I'm, I'm crying out. You're not answering. Yeah, Jesus. On the cross, why have you forsaken me? The thing is, God really had forsaken him. Why? Because Jesus looked at every human who would ever live and considered all of us more significant than he was. He paid for our sins to give us life, hope, and a purpose. And so we see all things in life through Jesus and the great gift of Jesus Christ. That's what he did. And so when we call out to God because of Jesus, we know this is true. When we call out to God, he's going to answer us whether we know he's doing it or not. He is with us in trouble whether we can see it immediately or not. He will rescue us. He will give us the honor of bearing the name of Christ and with long life, like stretch out long and make it eternal life. He'll give us satisfaction, not dissatisfaction, He'll satisfy us and He will always continually show us what He's up to, which is the saving of many, many people. And so with that in mind, we come to the table because the table is the weekly reminder that God has not forsaken us. That's why that Acts 13 is up there. That's what Paul is saying. Don't you know God has always been working to bring about your salvation through Jesus. Let's pray. Father, as we take this bread, we pray that we're seeing Jesus high and lifted up on the cross by evil men. But that worst evil brought about the greatest good. And we pray, Father, that as we take this, we celebrate this death and burial and resurrection until he comes. We are going to see him high and lifted up and seated on the throne of glory. So thank you for the sacrifice of his body and this a reminder through the bread of what Jesus has done for us in his name. Amen. And Father, also for the blood of Jesus, which continually cleanses believers from our sins. We thank you that we celebrate that you're always with us, cleansing us from our sins as we confess our sins to you. Thank you for uh, this, this cup, which reminds us of that and the real presence of Jesus in our lives. And we pray through Jesus. Amen. I would suggest you read the little short book of Habakkuk this week. He promises that he's going to be faithful no matter how bad times get. He un comes to an understanding without having all the explanations. And he promises to trust God in all of his areas of life, including his resources. And he says his giving is a demonstration of joy in God and that God has saved him. So uh, thank you for continuing to be supportive of our mission, our missionaries, the work of the church. We pray we'll be back together very soon and the work will be more visible that we're carrying on. But trust that God is working in you and me as we give because it's saying, Lord, I, I trust and I am so glad that you're my God, that you're my Holy One and that you've saved me. Father, we thank you for the privilege of giving to you a little bit with joy for all that you've done for us through Jesus. Thank you for working in the hearts of the women and the men and the girls and the boys in the Central Family and your church throughout your, the world. In Christ's name, amen. Well, as we wrap up today, I just want to thank you again for joining us, and I want to remind you of a couple of things, or let you know about a couple of things. First of all, uh, we've done something new. The elders, uh, we, they always love to stand at the doors and greet everybody on the way out, and we always love to give an invitation at Central, and since we're not able to do that virtually very easily, we've, we've set up this number. The number is 864 336 
3517. And if you text that number, uh, you, you can contact our elders and for, for really any reason you would normally. So if you have any questions about Central, if you're new to Central and you want information about who we are and what we do, and, and there's more than what you see on our website, then you can talk to our elders directly, text them, and they'll reach out to you. Uh, if, if you have any uh, concerns, or if you need any assistance, uh, you know, we know that there's some needs out there that, that are not getting back to us. And so if you are in need in any way, uh, we want you to be able to reach out to our elders so that they can address those needs. Uh, whatever it might be, um, feedback, comments, the elders want to be available to you. And so if you don't have, you know, of course their numbers are in the directory, but that number right there is a number we've set up specifically for you to respond uh, as an invitation to, uh, to the sermon uh, or to just anything that's going on in your life. And so we encourage you to take advantage of that if you need that, and uh, we'll make sure that we respond as soon as we receive any of those messages. Also, I want to remind you about what's coming up this next week. Again, guys, one week, Mother's Day. Make sure you take advantage of that or take care of that uh, and, and plan in advance because it might be a little more difficult to bless your mothers this year than, than ever before. But um, we are going to be delivering some things. We'll give you more information about that later this week. Uh, we'll be delivering a small gift to every female in our congregation between Thursday and Saturday of this coming week. Uh, that's all we have for today. Thank you so much. We're going to close with the song that we've been closing with every single, uh, every single week since we've been doing live stream. Let's all worship together one more time. Love.